Matthew Israel. I'm curator at large at Artsy. I'd like to welcome you to the final programming here at the Armory Show. I'm here to moderate a talk uh, featuring the artist JR. I'm sure some of you know him. Uh, and the gallerist and curator Jeffrey Deitch. We're having this talk on the occasion of the installation of the work So Close, which is on the facade of the Armory Show that's presented by Artsy, the Armory Show, and Jeffrey Deitch. So, um, these two need little introduction, but uh, I know this is a mixed group, so I'm going to provide some brief notes uh, just to talk about some of the amazing things that they have done in their careers thus far. So, JR is an artist who exhibits freely in the streets of the world, catching the attention of people who are not typical museum visitors. After finding a camera in the Paris metro in 2001, JR has traveled worldwide to create some of the most iconic art projects of the last decade. In 2006, he created Portrait of a Generation. These were images of suburban men and women that he posted in huge formats in the bourgeois districts of Paris. In 2007, with Marco, he made Face to Face, which has been called the biggest legal exhibition ever, and it consisted of huge portraits of Israelis and Palestinians face to face in eight Palestinian and Israeli cities. In 2011, JR received the TED Prize, after which he created Inside Out, an international participatory art project that allows people worldwide to get their picture taken and paste it to support an idea and share their experience. In 2016, JR was invited by the Louvre and made the famous dis uh, pyramid disappear through a surprising anamorphosis. And that same year, he worked with Rio during the 2016 Olympics and created new gigantic sculptural installations above the city using scaffolding that featured athletes and highlighted the beauty of athletic movement. Just this past year, JR co-directed Faces Places, a film with Agnes Varda, and this featured the two of them traveling around France to meet people and discuss their visions. The film, as you may have known, was nominated for, nominated for an Oscar for Best Documentary. Jeffrey Deitch has been involved with modern and contemporary art for nearly 50 years, and has had one of the most dynamic careers in the art world as an artist, writer, curator, dealer, and advisor. He started working in galleries in 1974 at the John Weber Gallery, working with some of the leading artists of the era, such as Saul LeWitt, Carl Andre, Dan Flavin, Robert Ryman, and Hans Hacke. In 1976, he surprised his art world friends by enrolling at Harvard Business School, which led, him, led to him eventually developing and co-managing Citibank's Art Advisory Service, the first professional art advisory service of its type and the first department in a major bank to specialize in art finance. In 1988, after nine years at Citibank, he opened his own art advisory firm and he continues to advise some of the world's most active collectors of modern and contemporary art. Deitch has written numerous articles, monographs, and catalog essays on artists spanning from Fernand Leger to Keith Haring, Jean-Michel Basquiat, and Jeff Koons. And in the 1970s and early 1980s, he was a regular contributor to arts and art in America. He's been especially engaged with artists who have emerged from street and graffiti culture and has been a primary critical and commercial voice for Basquiat, Herring, and Coons. Deitch project, Projects, the New York gallery he operated from 1996 to 2010, presented more than 250 projects by artists from 33 countries, and its history has recently been documented in Live the Art, 15 years of Deitch Projects that was published by Rizzoli in 2014. In 2010, Deitch closed the gallery to become director of the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles. During his three years at MOCA, he presented 50 exhibitions and projects, including the Painting Factory and Art in the Streets, which had the uh, highest attendance in the museum's history. Deitch has reestablished his art advisory service and exhibition program in New York at present and will be opening a Los Angeles gallery in September of this year. So we are here today to discuss JR's installation so close, but also to expand on and discuss JR's work in general, Jeffrey Deitch's involvement with it, and Deitch's reflections on decades of work with quote unquote art in the streets. After that, we'll have a chance to open it up to some questions, as I'm sure there will be some. And if you're using social media, uh, we're using the hashtag so close armory. So I'm going to move to the chairs. Hello? Okay. 
Okay, hi, JR. Hey. Hi, Jeffrey. Oh, hi. <laughs> um, so, JR, can you talk to us a little bit about what So Close is and uh, describe it in a little bit of detail, what it is, both image-wise and structurally, and the origin of this work? Yeah, uh, hi, everybody. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. It's a great pleasure to work with you, Jeffrey. Um, so, <laughs> thank you. Um, I'll, yeah, I'll tell you where So Close come from. Actually, a friend of mine gave me a book, uh, must have been six years ago, from Stephen Wilkers, who's actually in this room today, and he, uh, he's right there. And uh, uh, an amazing book, actually, where you would see the complete abandoned side of Ellis Island, the side that have never been open to the public. And I remember seeing this book and be like, wow, what a... You know, what a fascinating place. And that shows a lot of how I walk. I don't necessarily wait for invitation. When I got this book and I saw this walk, I contacted the Ellis Island and I said, how can I get there? And, uh, and I said, oh, no, it's closed. You cannot get there. Uh, I st still got a meeting. And uh, at that meeting, you know, we actually said, explain, you know, ideally we would get archive photos. You know, I was happy to do it and pay it on my own. Or, just, you know, I, uh, living in New York, I could just come easily and do the project. And it took five years to get the authorization to actually paste in the abundant side of Ellis Island. That's one image, um, this one's another, because on that whole section, there is still all the furniture. It actually is exactly intact, like it had been left since they closed Ellis Island. So you really feel the presence of the millions of people who have come through there and all the people who actually didn't make it because you would get to that section of the island uh, when you were sick or uh, they didn't know, you know, um, if you needed to be put in quarantine and you would be put there and you'd be so close from your goal because, you know, right there is the Statue of Liberty and, you know, um, you would arrive on the boat those pastings are still on the island actually it's tours that you can do, it's called the Hard Hard Tours uh, and you have you, you, you book online and they put two guards with you and it's a group of eight people and you can walk through those ruins. But you would be so close from the city and yet so far a lot of people had to go back all the way. So that's how, you know, I had to walk on Ellis Island for years and it's been fascinating because um, I shot a small film uh, that we gave for free and shared with everyone. Uh, We've done many projects uh, talking also about current migrants. This, is, this was for the film, so this was inside, was a you know, temporary installation, so it had to go. But last year, um, I got invited to exhibit for the first time outside of Ellis Island. And you know, really the team there is amazing. Uh, uh, They've never let any artists do any work on that side, so I felt really privileged. We opened it to the people. And when I got invited, of course, to paste on the outside, I wanted to paste photos of current migrants because I felt like I've pasted the photos and the archive of Ellis Island, and you know, I wanted to talk about the people of today, the people who are trying to make it here and, uh, and, and who can't anymore. And so I proposed an image with some eyes that would be on the outside so that, you know, people who pass on boat, it's millions of people who go to Statue of Liberty, who goes to Staten Island, who would see it. And it got refused. Uh, so I was like, well, you know, I mean, it's just eyes. What is the difference? Let me show you a crop of an eye from 1900 and a crop of an eye from today. It's the same, you know. And so they said, no, we can only do the archive photo because this is governmental. So I said, okay, let me think. I flew to the border of Syria with the photo, a famous photo from the archive that's actually in public domain, and, uh, which is a group of seven or eight migrants you know, uh, lined up to, uh, uh, you know, enter uh, to Ellis Island, uh, United States of America. And so I entered through Jordania, the border of Syria, and got to the camp. And I entered the camp and I, I said, can I meet anybody who looks like those people? Does anyone like look like this guy or look like this woman? And right away, the people say, oh, that's, that's funny. That's, that guy actually, he, there's a guy who sells chicken all the other way at the camp. He actually looked like that. And that woman could be my aunt. And then they took me. And then, like, we spent a couple of days, like, finding people. And when I would find them, and I would explain them. And I would say, do you mind if I take your photo? But you have to pose exactly in the same shape as that person was 
you know, posing. And so the people say, of course, but what do you want to do with it? I say, look, I want to replace your face by their face, and I want to see if, if I show them that photo, they, they'll see any difference. So the people say, of course, if that helps, uh, we'll do. So I photograph those eight people and replace the faces, which is something I never do. You have to know something about my work. There have never been any Photoshop in the history of my work. If not, if I start doing it, you would doubt any image you would see. But I thought one thing it needed to be done, and second, I've never lied on an image. I don't like, you know, uh, yes, I do stuff illegally, but I don't try to create polemic, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, yeah, you catch me in the street, I'm not going to say, I didn't do it, I don't know, I haven't seen those people. Uh, yeah, I've done it. Um, so anyway, I came back, sent the photo to Ellis Island, and said, okay, that's what I want to paste. And they said, oh, amazing, yes, sure. Um, we'll put it on the outside. It's like, okay, I can only do it next week. So they said, cool. Went there, put the scaffolding with the team, we started pasting, and uh, installed the walk. And, um, and everyone was like, great, amazing. They, you know, you, you couldn't be more close than that. We were all there looking at... And no one saw the difference. The people who know the best the image haven't seen the difference. I haven't announced it anywhere. This was last year. It stayed there for six months. Millions of people pass in front. That's it. I didn't try to make any like, wow, I've made it, we pasted it. It, that, it was there and it disappeared. And it's only last week that we revealed it on 60 Minutes. Uh, now that it's all gone and that the, you know, the rain has washed it away and that we installed it you know, in front of the Amory. So this is the actual image. And that's why we wanted to present it here. And that's why also the title of the show is called So Close. So is this the actual image that was on Ellis Island or slightly different? No, it's the actual exact image. Yeah. Okay, so you're just transplanting that image here. And so were there any issues like, I mean, the way that this is presented is, is on scaffolding. And that's something that's new for you relatively. Yeah. I, I, ha just I have to admit, I stole that idea to the North Korean because I went in North Korea and, uh, four years ago and uh, that's the, the advantage of being anonymous is you can take off your hat and glasses and travel on different passports and then if they don't look at your police records, you're just, you know, a nobody. <laughs> so I said I was working in a marketing agency in Switzerland and I was, you know, in charge of promotions and, and, and then first they refused it but I was like, oh, I cannot get better than that. I don't know what else. So I reapplied and it got approved. So of course, I, you know, that's the kind of places where you know, I realized that's where the limit is. <laughs> A lot of places I would tell you, it's not where you think it is. The limit is much further. When I went there, I thought, okay, that's where the limit is. I, 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 I actually pasted something the size of the top of my finger and I'm really proud of that, but it might be my smallest pastings, but at least it is in North Korea. But, <laughs> On my way back, I saw on the main square this giant, you know, really like propaganda image on scaffolding um, of a cutout. So it looked like billboard, but it's not advertising anything except, you know, the dictature. And so uh, I was like, wow, that's pretty powerful. And I started doing those uh, sculpture installations, like you mentioned, in Brazil and uh, in different parts. And so I, that's why I wanted to present it this way too kind of, you know, uh, not paste them on the building, but like play with the architecture. And, and you know, sometimes I can have like the one in Brazil, someone jump over a building, uh, that suddenly that becomes possible. Right. Um, Jeffrey, can you talk a little bit about your involvement in this project and then also just how you got to work with JR? Sure, well, first, it's such a privilege to work with JR. JR is the kind of artist I admire the most because JR makes art for the world, doesn't make art just for art fairs, though we're here, <laughs> and this is an important audience too, but it's really art for everybody. And also JR is one of the few artists who with great integrity can make art that takes on the important issues of today without being overly hectoring and you know, continuing uh, vanguard art tradition. Also, as you can see, JR is a great communicator and you know, very special. There, it's the rare artist who, in his personality, attitude, embodies the work and can push the work even beyond with his ability to articulate it. So we've known each other for a long time. I mean, it's wonderful. You, you told me your first trip to New York. You came to my gallery. 
I didn't meet you. I just drop a book on his, <laughs> on, you know, on his, on his table, hoping one day he'll see it. And when was that? Yeah. Uh, first time I came was 2004. Okay. And so we were able to work together, do a terrific project at the Art in the Streets show at the Museum of Contemporary Art in LA. JR pasted faces across the entire facade of the museum. It was a fantastic piece. And we did other things as well. And we've, we've done some public commissions uh, for buildings in New York City. Uh, we never did a big project like this. And when the Armory Show asked me, do you have an idea about something special that can engage the public, that can be outdoors, indoors, JR was the one. Thank you, Jeffrey. <laughs> it, it, Jeffrey, you've worked with some, you know, some of the most amazing kind of street, urban, graffiti artists of the era, and I'm, I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you see JR in the context of others you've worked with. So something very interesting about street art, that the original originators of Wild Style, and my hero, Lee Canonis, is right here in the front row. <laughs> uh, you know, their, it's, their, their innovations were so strong and profound, it was very hard for many years for artists working the public in this way to do something new. And so you see all over the world, artists working in the style that Lee initiated in New York City in the late 70s. Uh, so I thought for a while graffiti art got a little stale, repetitive. And so I was looking for people who were working in the street, call it sort of uncommissioned public art, people who don't ask permission, just do it on their own, but doing it in a way that was fresh. And JR is one of the people I came across who reinvented how to create this kind of public art. And in addition, there's another very important innovation. Uh, I think that JR is one of the artists extending how you can use the medium of photography. And uh, I, th I think extending it in a more interesting way than any other person using photography today. And maybe that's a good, uh, good moment to kind of talk about Faces Places. If anyone has not seen that movie, you should. I think it's now out on iTunes as of this week. Um, but I was really struck in that film about how exactly what Jeffrey's talking about, how it really illustrates the, the various different ways in which you use the photograph. First, going from photographs that you've taken to photographs that you set up that people, you know, kind of collaborate with you on them. And then you have your, your truck that drives around the countryside, uh, sort of photograph a, a camera on wheels. Um, Act <laughs> up right there. So, uh, can you just tell people a little bit about the movie, kind of a little teaser, so they'll go yeah. see it, which I think everyone should. Um, so I met Agnes Vada, who's right there with the funny haircut, uh, which I encourage everybody to do because it's pretty simple to do, but also <laughs> it changed, you know, how people see you and they they can tell there's some fun in you, you know, when you have such a haircut. <laughs> so Agnes is definitely someone that knows how to embody that. And so we actually never met, uh, and I knew her work in France, she's kind of a master of cinema, and also in the US, but you know, I realized a lot of my generation didn't knew her, and, um, and I knew her, I've seen her films, but I've never met, we've never been in the same room, and one day just an email came and her daughter said, oh, would you like to meet my mom? And I was like, wow, actually, yeah, I'll come. So I, I went there the next day, it was a Monday, and you know, she prepared some little cookies and pastramis and like some, you know, stuff that, you know, grandma does at home and, and showed me her photos and I, I had my phone only with me. I wanted to take a photo. I took one and then she said, oh, you can do better. I was like, I yeah, know, I'm sorry. I, I, you know, she's like, but why don't you, why don't you come to my studio? And she's like, okay, sure. You know, when? I was like, I don't know. I'm here now. So come tomorrow. Okay. Then she came the next day. And I remember she came and my studio is always, you know, with the team and friends that coming by, always hectic. And she just chilled there the whole day and talked to everyone. And um, that day was funny, it was the, 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 the rapper uh, Yassin Bey Mosdef was there. And, you know, 
he can be really like intense. And she actually like, boom, backflicked him and started talking to him. And I look at those two and I said, wow, she's in, you know, she's like camouflage. She can be in any, like talk to anybody anytime and, 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 and enter into um, their perspective, you know. And I mean, it was fascinating to see. So the next day I went back to her house and we, you know, we kind of felt both that we had friendship at first sight, really. So we were like, we should do something. But she didn't want to do any more movie in her life. She actually never co-directed or co-written in her life. And I was not planning to make any movie. So we just said, why don't we do you know, an art film, like a one minute piece, a two minute film, or five minutes. And that's how we started. We actually raised money online and went on the road. And we took you know, my photo booth truck that amazed her because it, you know, it prints the photo right away. And we drove through France, and you know that's one of the first things we did, like stop in a village and had no idea, and say, oh, you know, we had bread, so why don't we do a picture with the whole village, you know, eating the baguette, you know, that's where you put French people in a village with no ideas, that's what comes out, you know, <laughs> it's <laughs> like that's exactly what it. And then we went to factories and uh, uh, you know, involve everybody there, but it was interesting cause, because we were so naive and didn't know the whole context of the factory. For example, a lot of people told us after, they said, you know, we don't like this group of the people, we don't like this guy, or this is, we all different sections, and, but because we just want, wanted to involve everyone, we actually overpassed that, and the people for the art project also overpassed that, overpassed that difference. And we realized that actually, I was going often in a place in Normandy where I saw that bunker, and it's funny because normally when I see a place that I really want to paste on, I just do it the next week. But this one, for 10 years, it had really, um, you know, I didn't know what to do on it. I was really impressed by that bunker that fell from the cliff. And I was trying to get her there, but she was like, I don't care about your bunker. So, I, you know, she's really tough. She's really tough. And I can speak freely today because she's not next to me. If not, she would have stopped me already and I would not be saying a word. So I'm going to enjoy that freedom right now. And... Um, and then, uh, you know, one day I was there again and she said, you know, what are you doing there? And I tell her the name of the village and she's like, wow, I know that place. I, I came there in the 50s with Guy Bourdin, a famous photographer that's here on the photo uh, and uh, on that exact same beach. And she'd say, I even went there with my mother when I was seven years old in 1938. So before actually the bunker was built. And so then she came back in 1951 and did those photos. And so, you know, that's another story that we, we crossed past. So anyway, the, the film is a journey through encounters of people all around France. And, um, and, you know, and at the same time, she's losing her eyesight. So I'm trying to help her see as much as possible before it all disappears. So, you know, we had an incredible journey. It's an incredible, yeah. And that, that wasn't in the film, so you just went Exactly, yeah. Just, I'm giving like <laughs> teasers so people don't leave. <laughs> we'll talk about that. Um, I, I'd love you both to talk a little bit about funding for your projects. You know, both of you work with uh, not so normal, I mean, it's not to say that no one else does what you do, but um, not so normal funding uh, strategies. I don't know if you could talk a little bit about your strategy, and Jeffrey, you could talk a little bit about just how your projects have been funded and just how street art kind of, you know, doing really pathbreaking kind of installation work out in the world does pose a challenge for support. Yeah. I mean, so someone's going to pass with a hat and, uh, you know, everybody can give a donation. Wait, wait, That's wait, how it's we, going so we organize somewhere. talks. <laughs> now, so from the really beginning, because my work implicates people, um, I never wanted to have any corporate sponsors. So there's no brand, there's no sponsors, uh, uh, you know, there's no institution behind it that pays for it. And it was a rule that I set up from the really beginning because when I went and did one of the early projects in the Middle East, I couldn't paste on the wall between Israel and Palestine or in the cities there, you know, powered by Coca-Cola. Because on one side they'd be like, you know, we don't like Coca-Cola. And on the other side, if I've done it with Meca-Cola, which is, uh, you know, another brand, they'll be like, we don't like that. So it would actually link me with some political ideas that I don't even care. So depending on where the money comes from, it would be a nightmare. So from the really beginning, actually, and also because maybe they didn't want to sponsor me also, but I didn't even try. It was you know, easier to not ask any permission and to just self-find it. So because I don't come from money, 
I, the, the, you know, I was doing small jobs on the side, not photography job, because I never studied photography, so I'm not that good. <laughs> but like, you know, I could unload a truck, I could do other stuff that I would use the money for. And so that's how I really started at the beginning. And it's just black and white photocopy, you know? So it was, it was pretty small. But then, really quickly, I understood that uh, it would be only through the sales of my work that, um, that I could finance the project. But you have to understand that 99% of what I do is actually non for sale. It's in the street. Anyone can take photo, anyone can reproduce it the way they want, as long as it's not commercial. We don't sue anybody. The only people we sue actually is the brands who use my artworks as the background in advertising. And I can tell you that we actually <laughs> a won a lot of cases like that. Right. So sometimes I feel even conflicted about it because I'm suing people that have used on the back of a Volkswagen advertising a pasting that I haven't had permission to put. <laughs> and yet, you know, uh, like one time they won and they actually changed the face on post-production and there was nothing I could do. Anyway, so the way I have financed the work from the beginning was through setting, you know, 1% of my time goes to creating artworks uh, or documentation of the work that's ephemeral and our installation like uh, there was one I'm gonna go back close your eyes you've seen this you forgot this and then maybe you remember not this and that's the one I want to show before that one this one so that's for example a museum piece of 700 trains turning in circle and it's in a museum in, uh, in, in, in France and all those trains connect and create faces uh, so there's a smaller installation of that that's actually on the booth here. Uh, and those walks are glass walks so that, you know, depending on how you put the light, it reflects the entire image also on the wall. So walks that I always presented in gallery, walks that I couldn't do in the street, or videos, or that's how I got into film really early, um, or the documentation of the process, uh, a bit like Cristo does, you know, like the sketches. And I always mainly done unique piece, you know, or edition of three to the max, but I've really produced really rarely. I've done only two shows in my life in France, uh, two shows in the UK, and, uh, and, you know, this is the first time I present a, a major set of work in, the, in, in, in New York. So it's, it's been, uh, I've basically s uh, sell enough to finance my work, but uh, I've never, like, you know, my first gallery was in London, was Banksy and Lazaridis, who signed me when I was 22, and they were at the time, you know, playing with the market and doing the incredible uh, things, which was amazing to be, because right away, you know, I didn't know about the art world, I didn't know about, you know, I've never studied art, so I didn't know that there was all this world around, and, and then the next day, Damien Nurse was buying a piece of mine and stuff, and so it was incredible, but at the same time, I was like, wow, I'd rather take my time, because I can't, you know, burn that car twice, that's, that's how I want to finance my work for the rest of my life, I don't want to flip on in 20 years and say, okay, finally, I've done this with, you know, um, you know L'Oreal, because, you know, they do great stuff, you know, they do great hair and, and whatever, and then I'll be there talking to you about L'Oreal, who cares, you know? And they came to me many times through their foundations, through their, and I told them, I said, look, those people didn't participate in the project to even, you know, like talk about L'Oreal foundation or whatever foundation. So I've been always really careful about that. And, uh, and amazingly, people don't know, but when they buy artworks, that's where the money goes, but, um, a lot of people became shadow philanthropists. Can you believe that in New York, I don't pay rent for my studio? Because someone is like, well, if you're gonna send posters for free around the world to people, can I at least help you put your printer in a place that you won't pay rent? And it's been seven years. And you meet sometimes people like that who's not doing it for the credit they get out of it, but for the purpose of the actual project. And I call those people shadow philanthropists. And I can tell you that I've met people like that. They exist, they're really rare. But they are the people that, to me, really change the world because they do it for the purpose of the project. Right. <laughs> Jeffrey, can you talk a little bit about Deitch projects and just how kind of, you know, those kind of real path-breaking, challenging, very risky, some of them very risky projects actually came to fruition and, and very much like challenged the traditional gallery model. So Deitch Project started when, after I visited artists in their studios over a few years and look at, if it was a painter, several new paintings or a sculptor, the work on a pedestal. But then often the artist would say, let me show you something. I want to get out my drawings for the project I really want to do. 
And I found that most artists had a dream project that didn't fit in to the conventional art business structures. So I decided, well, why not open a project space where we can give artists a platform to realize these dream projects that might not be very commercial. And so that was how Deitch Projects began. And sometimes the project was a performance. Uh, one project was uh, the artist walking naked down Canal Street. Uh, the other, other infamous project, Oleg Kulik living in the gallery as a dog for two weeks. But what I found is that if the art is inspiring, somebody is going to try to find a way to get involved and maybe actually buy it. So most of our radical projects actually sold. And it gradually became an economically viable model. And so it was called projects because it was about projects rather than conventional gallery representation. Yeah, and you've even compared it to kind of almost like an institute of contemporary art or like a Kunsthalle where it's like a rotating exhibition where it's not like you're dealing with discrete works on the wall, but, but kind of most of them were installations. Yes, and a number of them went out into the street, out into the city. Right. Um, can you talk a little bit about just, you know, you've had to navigate the whole world of street art, graffiti art, urban art. How do you feel about all these labels, both of you? I mean, kind of, what do you use? Because um, I feel, I mean, I, I, having talked about this at various times, I feel uncomfortable with most of them. You talk about yourself as an urban artivist. No. <laughs> I think, I mean, it's an interesting <laughs> but, question. When I started, I had yeah. no idea about that you could be an artist because graffiti you would have been taken as a vandalist. So I was yeah, a vandal. Yeah. So you never think of, you know, being an artist. I never told my mother one day I'm gonna be an artist. You know, we had no artists in the family. It was not a term that we know the so uh I, and I know that I could get arrested and I got arrested for doing graffiti. So it was, you know, it would never be a pass. But then when I found that camera, I was like, wow, now I can be a photographer. And I was happy about that. But really quickly I realized that I was more excited about pasting those photos. So then, yes, I became a wallpaper guy, if you want. And then slowly I thought, okay, you know, they, they, they I went through many times, but then I realized doing different projects like choreography or like films or sculpture is that, you know, artist is the, you know, is the most incredible term ever. Mm -hmm. And I realized also the power of that word wherever you go in the world and you're not affiliated with anybody, not even an NGO, and you say, I'm an artist, the people really open your, their door. It's like, it's like almost a, a sesame to go anywhere in the world, and it works. Jeffrey, can you talk a little bit about those terms? Or? So one of my missions for a long time has been to put, make the case in the art community that there's no such thing as a subcategory of street art that's not real art. And so I've always worked with artists who, their work on the street and public, uncommissioned public projects without thinking that this is a separate category that is not somehow not as good or not as worthy of artists who do conventional paintings on canvas. So the word, the term street art became used about 20 years ago to differentiate the work from graffiti that had a negative connotation. But then something complicated has happened. Street art became so popular that a number of, of artists came in onto the scene who were more interested in branding and making money uh, than in putting out work just for the public. So you know, now someone can get their name out, uh, build a brand, and then work for Coca-Cola or Pepsi. And so there's this problem of the dilution of street art. So a number of the artists who have been put in that category are running away from it. So it, it, it reinforces more that it, it should all be about who is an innovative artist rather than a street artist and 
a real artist. You know, I'll add something on, uh, yeah, uh, uh, on what Jeffrey said is, uh, in London in 2008, so pretty early in, you know, I don't know, I, was, I must have been 24 or, or whatever, I, I was invited to paste on the outside of the Tate Modern, which is, you know, wow, amazing. And there was five other artists and we all shared the whole outside of the Tate Modern. And, um, and then we still, we, you know, so we signed the paper, great, yeah, we're gonna do it, and we go, we do it, and we, we're all really excited. And then I remember someone called me and said, oh my God, you're on the website of Nissan Qashqai. So a, 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 the, Nissan being the brand of the car and Qashqai being the model of the SUV they were doing. I was like, how is that possible? So I go there and then we see all, the name of the five artists around the car. So then I, I called the curator and said, what's happening? How do we end up on this side? Oh no, be, no, don't worry because the show is sponsored by Nissan Qashqai. And so, you know, and I was like, well, this is not possible. And so we talked between us, all the artists, and we said, okay, we're all pulling out of the show. Sayonara, see you. <laughs> and then they were like, whoa, what? And I said, look, the museum's supposed to be the museum presents, the artist, ta ta ta, with the support of, okay, that's how it had been traditionally made, and a real thank you too. And now it was Nishan Kaskai present at the Tate Modern, and the artist, da da da. And you even end up sending a car. So we made a letter, all of us, that said, you know, we don't care about the show anymore, we want to be pulled out of all those sites and of the museum. And then they apologized and kept up the show and threw off Nissan Qashqai, but it shows you how you would thought that when you get to the Tate Modern, that's the moment where you, okay, great, I made it, you know, like we're here. Actually, that's where you need to work the most to make sure whenever, you know, we've worked on exhibition, that's where you need to check where the money is coming from, how it's going to be financed, where they're going to put their logos. And when I've done the show at the Louvre, you know, I remember the president of the Louvre saying, okay, you're going to do work on the pyramid. And he opened the door and there was like 30 people lined up around the table from the conservator, the, the people, the fire department, security, uh, partenariat, you know, the people that do sponsorship and stuff, and they all introduced themselves, how they will help. And as soon as the people from the partnership, you know, said, hey, we can't wait, it'd be really easy to finance because the museum don't have money, but, and I say, you know what, you can leave the room because I'm not, we have such a short period of time, I don't want to be talking with, you know, whatever brand of clothes or whatever that at the end would want to use it for promotion. And it's really delicate, and, um, and, and, and it needs that same amount of work you've put on the actual work into how to make the show, and I think it's as important. Mm -hmm. Well, touching on the Louvre, I mean, I, uh, there's, there's a great picture online of, of, of uh, you said for that, for that um, installation, everyone had to kind of stand in a, oh in a line. Everyone <laughs> close your eyes, boom, 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 boom. There might be some holiday photos in there, I don't know, I don't remember. <laughs> You know, up, we don't want to see that. Tack, 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 tack. Up, up, no. Boring, up, up, no. And maybe, no. Wow, damn, it's up right there. Oh, we lost Almost. It. We almost got it. You saw it, right? There it is. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, so, so supposedly, I mean, that point of view, if you see it from any other angle, it doesn't set up like that. But, yeah. that, you know, that's, that is a huge social media moment. And, <laughs> and I was wondering, you know, social media, when you started out, there's no Facebook, there's no yeah. Instagram. But it's, it seems like it's been a great thing for you, your work, for, for, street, for art in the streets in general. Can you talk about kind of your use of social media, what it's meant to you? Jeffrey, could you talk a little bit about kind of how you see this kind of connection between street art and social media and what it like sort of benefits mm. negative aspects, if there are any? You know, the, um, the weird thing is that I got pretty late on social media, but in 2001, when I started doing my stuff in the street, I, I, um, I actually had a website right away. And I made a website that's still the same name today. And I would paste, uh, I would put a photo a day. It's called the photo du jour, the daily photo. And I did that for years and years. And then I replaced it by Instagram that then posted on my website every day. But I had that kind of, of, of continuity. It was a way to share before social media. But when social media came, I saw the way of finally engaging more because my website, and it's, we still have it, we had a map of the world where you could uh, you know, tune up and say, I'm ready to pace whenever. And when you say that, 
it would show on the map. So suddenly you would see that in Bangladesh, there was 2,000 people just like ready. And you're like, wow, we should do a project there. That actually influenced on how I would go and do project. So I, and you can still see that map, even if now people do it through social media. We had that for years before we started using uh, Instagram. And, and an idea like this actually came because um, when you, you know, I, of course I've never thought that I would ever do something while being alive at the Louvre, you know. So <laughs> when they told me I could do an installation, I literally had no idea because I've looked at that building and that pyramid on my life, and, you know, but literally not sparkling any probably, idea. It's probably the best possible installation <laughs> spot you could have at the Louvre. <laughs> yeah. So, but wait, I went and see, I went and hang on the square and look at people and you know what people do when they come from around the world is they arrive in front of the pyramid, they turn their back to it and they take a selfie. And I was like, wow, we go, you know, we go and see the monuments that inspire the most just to photograph ourselves in front of it and turn our back to it. And so that's why I decided to make it disappear. And depending on where you walk, you see it completely appear, completely disappear. And um, a lot of the projects, um, so there was only one point to take a photo. So you had to do a line and that would self-organize by people where when you have to wait for an hour in the line, you actually do speak with other people. A lot of my projects are an excuse to create real interaction between people. And that's a really important part in what we do. And I can show you an example that actually have been built only for that. I'll go back and ba ba ba, tac, tac, tac. we saw this already, and sh sh sh, up right there. So you see that piece here was built um, you know, on the Mexican side of uh, the wall. The, uh, you know, and so that's the Mexican side, the other side is the US side. That was last September. That's exactly a piece that resumes on how I use, at the same time, social media, anonymity, and participation of people, because I've never thought of pasting on that wall because it's see-through, so I can't paste on it. But, you know, that wall being advertised on television every day because, uh, you know, of a certain president, I forgot his name, so I thought, wow, actually, I never thought of, you know, of, of this wall before, but, um, now that I'm doing installation with scaffolding, maybe we should go back. So we went and we took the road that you can see on the left side, on the US side. And I was looking for a spot on the Mexican side that I could install something. But not knowing any regulation at all. I don't know, you know, who controls this. So when we find a good spot that was not too far from a big city, so it was San Diego, that was actually close from a, a, a checkpoint that you, we could pass, you know, custom border. We went on the other side looked around, it looks like that didn't disturb anybody, that piece of land, because people were living a little bit around. So we went and, you know, we went and rented the bulldozer. I'm sure that's what everyone do when they don't know what to do. They just rent a bulldozer and we went and like dig the hole. And we started digging the hole, waiting for someone to say, excuse me, you know, can I see the papers? But believe it or not, no one did. <laughs> and the border patrol keep pass. Uh, you know, they pass there every day and they never ask anybody anything. And we built that entire hole and the neighbors would bring us water and say, oh, what are you guys doing? Oh, we just, you know, just digging a hole, okay, <laughs> whatever. So we made that, that, so it was flat. Then when that was done, we went and rented the, the Mexican company uh, scaffolding. And we told the guys, well, we want to build it and we already prepared the land for you guys, but we actually want to build it. The location is right there. I, yeah, I know it looks like really close to the wall, but don't worry, it's, you know. I mean, it should be fine. So they were like, okay, why not? They went and started installing the scaffolding. And the scaffolding is three, three times the size of the wall, you know? And so there's also helicopters flying by for the border patrol. I don't know who would actually at some point would say, guys, you cannot build like a building next to the wall, you know? <laughs> but believe it or not, no one said anything. So then we put the wood panel and in one day we pasted the image and then past the wall, I took off my hat and glasses, and so the border patrol guy, I mean the costume guy asked me, you know, where are you from, France, what are we doing? You know, I was just doing tourism, great, and um, <laughs> you know, what's your occupation, photography, and, um, and so he's like, oh, you know, have a good day, and then I passed and put back my hat and glasses, went there, took that photo, posted it, and say, work in progress, because we were still finishing it and stuff. At that moment, I didn't even have the time to explain who was the little kid and the vision that it went, you know, through social media further than I could have imagined. But that day we left. And the next day I posted and I said, guys, actually, this is the point where you can go and see the piece. 
and it's going to be there a couple of weeks, uh, you know, uh, if they don't shut us down, and you can go and see it. Now, one thing that I haven't planned is that people came from, you know, all over, thousands of people, but on each side. Now, what you do when you go and you go there to actually take a selfie or take a photo and say, I was here, and you see through the wall someone from the other side who was actually doing the same thing. People pass their phones through the wall and say, do you mind taking a really cool photo of me through the fence? And I'm taking a really cool photo of you through the fence. And then I've started seeing those photos every day popping up on the internet. And I'd be like, wow, that's the coolest. We never thought of that because normally you get arrested right away if you do that. But after two weeks, I was like, wow, if they didn't arrest anybody because we couldn't read any story of someone who said I had a problem, it means that they must be shutting their eyes on it. So then after another week, so it was three weeks in, of, or, or two weeks and a half, we were almost, we had to take it down because we rented the scaffolding. So, you know, there's a certain moment that we could pay. So, of course, we had the idea on the Monday. We were like, wow, you know, every great art exhibition have an opening and have a closing. So we should do a closing, you know, and maybe make a lunch or something. So, but we got overconfident, and that's, that's a good lesson. Not, don't get overconfident. And we send the plan of the table to the Border Patrol. That would have been super nice till now. So we're like, let's ask them if they let us put our table because this is going to disturb the cars also from the Border Patrol that passed there. And they didn't reply, so we started preparing a table. We started building on the, on the Mexican side. We built a big table in wood, photographed a woman who, who's a dreamer, and started pasting. And then on the Friday, we received a letter that says that if we do this, they will arrest everybody, deport people, break every visa, and this, you know, would be a violation of like regulation or whatever. And then it was all lawyer stuff. I don't understand it. I'm French, so I said, let's do it. <laughs> so then we went and we actually had nobody on the other side and everybody was on the Mexican side. So the day before, I put it on social media, hey guys, tomorrow is the last day to see the piece. And the funny thing actually, that when I was taking photos with people at the entrance, there's teachers from the French um, school here that were in the plane with us, and we told them, guys, we can't tell you what we're doing, but come and see the piece tomorrow at lunchtime. Where are you guys, actually? They're somewhere here. There are three of them. Are you still there, or they left? They were bored. <laughs> oh, no, they're here. <laughs> and, uh, and they came to the lunch. Like, you know, not many people, like maybe 70 people who showed up around that moment, or 80. As soon as there was enough, we passed them through the fence. Because, of course, you know, I'm, I'm a little chick and I was scared. I was stayed on the Mexican side. I didn't want to get caught. So I just passed them the top and, and with the other side of the eye. And I say, yeah, can you align it? And then we send the drone and then put the table. <laughs> then we... Thank you. You see, it's not that many people, but enough to make a great lunch where half of the music band was on one side, the other half of the same band were on the other half playing the same music. We were all sharing the same water. We were smuggling tacos through the wall so that people who didn't brought food would have it. And for two hours, we almost forgot that there was a wall. And then suddenly an hour after, an hour and a half after, there's a, a border patrol that arrives and he come out of his car, he get close to the wall, and, you know, so I get close to the fence because, you know, he can't get, I'm, I'm seen, but not that seen that he can get me through the wall. And then, you know, um, we, we actually, there's a video online, we actually shared tea. And, uh, and he stayed there the whole day and talked with even the woman, the dreamer, that, you know, was supposed to be arrested for just being there. And, and then I asked him if I could post that video, you'll see it online, and, uh, and he said, please do, because if at our level we don't start changing that, then who will, you know? And so it's really brave to have done that. It's amazing. <laughs> What's so amazing, though, is, is also, you know, so many people have, so many people that know about this project never saw it right, in person, but yeah. they saw it on your Instagram, social media. I think I first saw it, there was an article in the New York Times about it when I first saw the first image. Um, it's, it's just incredible, kind of, uh, that, the kind of tool that, that Instagram allows, yeah. you know. And, but, but yeah. you know, we tried, actually, one of the original plan was to try and get journalists to, like, cameras and stuff so that the Border Patrol wouldn't approach. 
And we couldn't because it's true, you would ask me on the Friday or even the week, it's like that was just an idea, but we didn't know if it would happen. Maybe it would have been killed in the egg right at the beginning. And I'm always ready to take that because I don't see it as failure. Like in every project we do, whenever there's more risk of failure than success, that's where the project is interesting. That's why we are artists. That's why we need to try things that others don't. Because as artists, you're allowed to fail. What's the big deal? Who would have cared? You probably would never have heard about it, and it would have been a boring weekend for us, and that's it. Well, it's hard to like, you know, I couldn't tell all the big papers and TV, yes, it's sure, this is the time, that's where you can park your car, that's why. It was completely, so everyone documented it like this, and, uh, and a few blogs came, and then the image was shared, and shared by the people. Hmm. And, uh, Jeffrey, from your perspective, I mean, how, how has social media changed what you do? Well, something like this, see, prior to Instagram and other social media, the only way something like this could exist in art is if the New York Times covered it, if Art Forum covered it, or if there was a whole endorsement system involving a museum. And what's great now is an artist can be independent. An artist doesn't need this whole network of endorsements in order for art to be realized and to go out into the world. I mean, do you see, do you see any flip side to that? Is there, is there any flip side to kind of the, the, the sort of excessive popularity of some things that are on Instagram? You know, the art world, obviously, it's, there's a balance between too much exposure historically and, and not enough. Sure, and that's something that the art discourse is going to have to deal with because there's a lot of superficiality now. But I'm, I'm, I'm very confident that artists and people who, curators, will figure out a way to reassert a kind of a seriousness. Hmm. So um, I want to open it up for questions, but I have uh, one last question for both of you, which is, um, you know, the worst question that you get when you, when, you, when you do a project is everyone's wondering what's next. So I want to pose that to, to both of you. Jeffrey, first, can you talk a little bit about the, your projects or coming up, uh, the gallery a little bit, and then JR, can you talk a little bit about what you're up to? Sure, well, I think some of you know the story that I didn't last very long at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles. Um, some people thought the shows were too popular. So I'm opening a gallery on my own, will be very ambitious, and I'll be able to do museum level exhibitions without asking anyone's permission. And <laughs> it's one of the reasons I love artists like JR and artists coming out of the street culture, because they don't have to ask anyone's permission. They have an idea they believe in, they just do it. And that's, for me, that's very inspiring. You know, I remember uh, um, that, that question of uh, what's next always scared me. Or like, you know, you just finished something and people are asking, what's next? And it used to bother me, and then I realized that, because I never knew also what's next, you know? And, uh, but I actually love the fact that I don't know what's next because all of those projects, you see, they, sometimes they happen from the Wednesday to the Sunday. So, but recently I've started working on a project that take me a little more time than from the Wednesday to the Tuesday. So let me see if I can go back to that all the way back. Okay, so you see th that, that's a mural that I've done about the neighborhood where I first um, oh, I, I have the photo elsewhere, it doesn't matter. Where I first uh, started, it's in the, the suburbs of Paris, it's called Clichy Montferme, that's where I did my first project, and I, I, where I pasted uh, my friend holding his video camera like a weapon. Uh, I can't find you that image, actually, it should be earlier. Boom, 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 boom. Oh, it should not, actually, no, let's go back. It's, it's the other way, but doesn't matter. It's... Um, I went back in the neighborhood just last April, and because I've been, uh, you know, going there for 15 years, and the, the mayor at the time when I pasted the image of my friend holding his camera like a weapon sued me at the time. That's how actually I got to New York in 2004 because I escaped France for one year. I didn't want to pay the fines, but when I came back, <laughs> the riot exploded. And if you remember the riots of 2005, they actually started in this neighborhood. 
because the two kids that died by being chased by the, the police that were 13 years old actually hide in an electric box that were right by the photo I pasted. And so the image that you saw on the cover of New York Times was cars burning and people, and on the background there was, you know, those images pasted. That was actually the first time my work had been shown, being the background of the largest riots we had in France since the French Revolution, because then those riots went all over France. So I've always been attached to the neighborhood, and they destroyed the buildings, and, you know, because that neighborhood was almost like a no-go zone. And, um, and I went there in the inspiration of Diego Rivera and Orozco and great muralists like that and photographed everybody at the same level, which means that everyone is in the same light. Everyone is represented the same way. No one is more important than another. Oops, I see here the mayor who actually sued me, who actually is still the mayor today and is the, you know, is in the mural. Uh, he's right there with the white thing. Um, I, the guy who's... Uh, uh, you know, in front of the fireman trying to stop the fire is the, you know, the guy who lost his brother that started those riots. The people who are talking all over there are people who are discussing about the whole reconstruction of that neighborhood. The guy that's showing a book to his friend is a guy who actually bank, uh, 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 who, who went and, um, and did a bank robbery in the bank that spent 25 years in jail, but still is part of that neighborhood. I was not looking for only the good people or the bad people, I was trying to represent everybody. And, uh, and then we installed this at the Palais de Tokyo in Paris. And it was an incredible day because uh, the French president wanted to see the inauguration. And, um, and he came, but his security asked him to be there at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, where the opening was a bit later. So when he got here and he saw that's part of the history of France now, no one can deny it, and you know what had happened in that neighborhood. And um, he said, where are the people? And I say, well, Mr. President, if, you know, you ask that there be nobody when you come. They're only coming at around six. I was like, well, I need to see this with the people represented. So he asked to stay. And so we got to chill for two hours and a half because people were late, of course. So, you know, <laughs> we chilled in the museum, like, you know, check some out and, you know, took a grenadine or whatever and then came back there. Everyone came. And they were so excited to see themselves that they even forgot about the president. And so then he asked them, well, can you tell me who is who? And people explained how they were presented, how it was mirroring their life and, you know, what they've been through. And so he said, well, if you let me and if the mayor who was there also, uh, you know, if, if you give a wall for that piece in the, in the neighborhood, I'll come and inaugurate it, which he did. And we installed it there. And it was a really moving day because no president have been able to come in that neighborhood and do a talk. Uh, or even the mayor itself cannot go in that neighborhood anymore. He hasn't been back in years. And, uh, and there was conversation that day. And the people reconnected. And for the first time, the president said, well, now you're part of the patrimony. This is our heritage, and you're part of it. So the people felt mirrored and represented and being part for the first time of the French culture. So it was a really moving day. So I'm doing uh, more of those murals. I've just done one in San Francisco that would be exactly the same concept, except that it's all video. Everyone is moving within each other. That's gonna be presented at SF MoMA next year. And we're doing one also in New York that I'm happy to announce will be at the Brooklyn Museum next year also. So we're gonna start working on it. Thank you. So basically, you can all be part of it, you know, and uh, We'll be, uh, you know, shooting for, for weeks and weeks uh, to make this mural happen. And all the people are uh, just random people we met in the street from, you know, all different backgrounds. So exciting. Um, I'm going to open it up for a question. Everybody's been so patient. And uh, thank you all for standing, being so patient in the back. Um, so we could take a few questions. Uh, yeah, in the front, the black shirt. You want to know the story of the moon? Great, yeah. I was uh, just gonna repeat okay, her was it before or after? Let's see. Oh, yeah, right there. Okay, so right after I've done the favela in Brazil, uh, which was 2008, this is the first favela of Brazil. It's called Providencia. It's also the home of the largest commando of drugs. It's called the Red Commando. That uh, is one of the only commando that kills police too. So they kill each other and they kill police. So it's a place where there have been no NGO 
no association, no eyes witness. So when we done that project, from here it looks like that's just another favela. In Brazil, people were like, how is that possible in this favela? So when we finished that project and we realized that the drug dealer closed their eyes on letting us do this because they saw the power of representing women in the community and uh, we decided to buy a house there, which was really cheap because there was a house at the top of the top, top of the hill that would always get bullets in the walls and no one wanted to buy it and the old man just wanted to leave because he was really in crossfire all the time. And we were like, hey, we're the Frenchies, we, we buy it. And so I remember I taped the money on my body, I went up to him and I said, look, I, I, you know, I'll get it, Let, let's, let's do an art center. And so we bought the house and um, we, went to the local store down there, we asked them which was the cheapest paint they had, and they said, well, we have a special promotion on yellow. We're like, great. <laughs> so we bought it, and we call it the yellow house. Casa Marella means the yellow house. So that was done, the whole concept was done in, a, in five minutes, and then we're like, again, okay, let's, let's make it a school, you know, but we were 24 or 25 years old, had no idea of how to run a school. So we just let the door open, but we didn't have money to put tables and chairs. So slowly the community, we just put a plate, actually, that's the only thing we made. We engrave a plate saying this house belongs to the community, the cultural space, and anyone's welcome. And so people started hearing about this rumor that there was a cultural house for the first time there. So say, oh, I'll come and I do a poet, uh, you know, uh, I read poems at, on the Fridays, I'll come and I'll help people fill their paper, I'll come and, and that's how it started, and now it's been 10 years. And uh, over the last 10 years, recently, I mean two years ago the drug dealer changed, or three years, the, the head of the commando changed, and we thought that maybe, you know, if you want to come in and say that's my house, you know, then I, I won't show up again, it's as simple as that. So. But we came with a bunch of artists, and one of them is here, his name is Takao, he's in the room, and he built that entire tree here with a friend of his named Derby. And he's all the way at the corner there because he's shy, but they built this, and, the, and he lived in the favela for months, and the drug dealers couldn't believe how crazy they were to suddenly make a tree go through the windows, and by making the house the craziest, it made them don't want to be part of it because they would look crazy being in there. So. Then we thought, wow, that's actually a good thing. The more crazy we make it look, the more it also attracts people from the community to the house. Because you can't really go in the favela from the outside. It's not a, they've tried to pacify it. It didn't work there. So the, the school is really for the, only for the people who never had any TV, any press there. Because we, you know, we don't need to advertise it. It's just for the people there. So it's already filled. And, but recently, we were on the rooftop. And we look at the, you know, the sky and we were like, wow, you know, because the city never came to claim money for the electricity, we're borrowing from the nice contributor of the city for the water, we connected like everyone else, we're like, who would say anything if we do something in the sky, you know? Who would actually come and stop us? And so I asked the neighbors and I say, do you mind if I build something in the sky? And uh, he was like, I don't care as long as, you know, as long as it doesn't fall on my house. I was like, no, no, I mean, I, I don't know how to build it, but we'll find. And then um, we were like, well, what should we build? And we built, well, let's build the moon, you know? So that was the idea. Then we find a crazy engineer who was ready to do it. And so that's the inside of the school. You see, it's pretty simple. Uh, it's Takao also who built all the tables you see there, all the frames and, you know, uh, everything has been handmade. So we started building a moon. Uh, like, uh, I don't know how many, uh, t uh, is it 12 meters above the house, so 36 feet in the sky above the house, that's already the highest point of the favela. And we built it in steel that is bulletproof because, you know, bullets are really flying there. And uh, we wanted to make it a bedroom so that when artists come to give class, they can sleep there. And uh, so we built it, and because you cannot bring any car up there or any construction trucks or whatever, we had to carry with 50 men everything up there. And the way it was built was actually the craziest part because you couldn't, you know, except bringing those really uh, small scaffolding, it was really complicated to get anything up there. But, you know, then slowly it got all the way to the top, and that's how it looks in the inside. And, um, and artists can come from around the world and sleep in there. And it's, uh, it's, you know, it's a place you'll see if you go to Rio. There's better photo online, but it's basically flying in the sky of, of, of Rio. And, um, and it's, uh, it's, it, it have, since then we have received hundreds of people who want to come and give classes there just to be able to sleep in the moon. But the moon belongs to the people, so they are the only ones who have access to it. That's incredible.
One more, one more question. Yeah, in the back. Yes. Yeah. So she lived right across the street from a church in Franklin and uh, uh, here in New York where there's a big mural of actually a photo that's presented on the booth uh, because it's an archive photo from Ellis Island of some, you know, immigrants that arrived in the 1900s and I pasted this, you know, uh, actually two years ago probably and they said they would build a building in front in the next six months and now it's finally happening. So it's interesting, I invite you to go there on Church and Franklin, I went there yesterday, you really see them disappearing slowly. So the image will get stuck in between buildings so it'd be there forever. But uh, it's interesting symbolically that slowly, you know, we think that floor by floor, those people that, you know, building this, uh, this building that making those faces disappear. Well, you'll have to do more in New York for us. With pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much, JR. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank, thank you, you, everyone, Jeffrey. so much for being here. And thank you. And I really want to thank the Armory for this incredible occasion and Artsy for have supporting the project. So thank you so much.